this is the last week of Jonah. I'm going to miss that music, to be honest with you. Um, and uh, in this series, we've been talking about uh, the book of Jonah in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scripture. scripture. Uh, I went southern there for a second. Uh, that's cool. Uh, um, and Jonah's a prophet who's kind of like the worst person in the story. He's like this spiritual uh, failure. I mean, he's, he's, like, he's, he's a guy who does everything wrong. And we see how he interacts with God and how he, interview, he, how he interacts with the people around him. So we're going to wrap that up today. First of all, I do want to say um, thanks to all of you, not just participating members, but everybody who makes this church what it is. We had some needs for people to make coffee and greet, and so I've put Facebook posts on the past couple of weeks. Hey, we need some people to do this. And like, unlike any other church I've ever been in before, people actually volunteer to do those things. It's so nice. People, oh, I'll do it. Oh, oh wow, okay. It's not used to that in, in the church world. So it's amazing to be a part of a church where people believe in what we're doing and believe in who we are as a congregation who want to make it happen. Last week was kind of an example of what, one of the things that makes us unique. How many of you think Colby did a good job last week, if you're here? And so the, you're here because you believe in it. And we want to thank you uh, for giving of your, your time and your, your skills uh, to make this church a reality. So thank you to those who volunteer. We have some more needs in greeting and kids, and if you want to do that, see me after the service, but I want to thank you for that. also want to welcome my friend Imam Khalil Sultan, who surprised me today. He, Imam Khalil is a Muslim imam in Maricopa. He's been here twice before um, speaking in the church, and uh, we had a great coffee last Sunday afternoon where we just uh, sat there for a couple of hours and talked. Uh, he's, he's a wise man, and we talked about societal change and how all these different factors, even if we don't like them at the time, can actually work for good. And I really appreciate you. Thanks. Let's welcome Imam Khalil here this morning. So uh, I got my hair cut last Saturday before Colby spoke here because whenever Colby comes, you want to make your hair look as good as possible. You know what I mean? <laughs> even though it's pointless to try to compete with the guy. And so I got my hair cut, and the guy who cuts my hair is Tom. And um, uh, went down, you know, waited in the lobby for a second. I was going through my Facebook feed, and I saw a video of little Presley Knox. You know, Presley is six months old. If, you're, if, uh, if, if you've been around here, uh, Presley is a six-month-old little girl who's battling cancer right now. And, uh, and so I saw this video of, of her uh, there in the hospital. And then uh, Tom was like, hey, ready? Ready to come back? And so I just watched this heartbreaking video. And then the guy who cuts my hair is like, hey, man, come on back. All right, all right. So you know, snap out of it. And uh, on the way back to the chair, I remembered his wife or his fiance is a nurse at Children's Hospital, which is where Presley is. And, and uh, I said, hey, man, I, I've been at Children's Hospital a lot this week. And, and uh, so we talked about it a little bit. And uh, he said, well, what do you do when you're a pastor and you go visit a, a child at the hospital? And I said, well, you, you comfort the family, you, you stay positive, you know, you encourage them to be strong and be positive and kind of let them vent a little bit, show empathy, and you pray with them. And he, he said, what do, you, what do you say when you pray with them? It's a good question, right? Um, and so I said, well, I always pray for amazing things to happen. I always pray for healing and for recovery, of course. And I said, I've also learned over the years that uh, I really, really appreciate doctors and nurses and medical science. Um, I, I've learned to be incredibly thankful for them and to never diminish what they do because I'm, I'm a dad and I'm personally thankful for them. And, and while we're talking and praying, and you've got nurses and doctors buzzing around doing incredible uh, healing work that would have been considered miraculous in any other time in world history, and I, I think it still kind of is. And um, so we had this conversation, and, and he, he admitted, okay, so his wife works there, um, and you can imagine how difficult that is. And so all the time, on a daily, imagine this, unless you do work in that environment, and you, you feel it too. Imagine, you know, all the time, children in crisis and their families thrown into crisis and praying and crying out to God and being in probably what is the worst moment of their lives, right? And, and that's just your environment. And you see how people react to that. You see how it affects people. You see how they're able to deal with that kind of jolt, that shock, that sadness, if they're able, if they're able to move on in time. If, you know, however, you just see that 
all the time. And so they're getting my haircut. We had this profound conversation about people in very difficult times of their lives that tempt them to give up hope, that tempt them to be angry, angry at God, angry at life, ang- you know, just angry. And, and what do you do when you, you feel like you hit rock bottom and, and you're in this time that, that changes everything? And that's what really the book of Jonah is about. That's what chapter four is about, the last chapter we're talking about today. And uh, there's a, a question. It's actually the last verse of this entire book. The, the book ends with a question. I love this book. It's just fantastic literature. And it, it ends with a question. So it's like the story of Jonah continues. It, it doesn't stop with the book, but it asks all, the reader, which is all of us, a question that we have to answer, that we have to deal with, and we have to deal with it often, many times in life, not just once, but many, many times. And so that's where we're headed today. And, and so as we talk about difficult subjects like, you know, praying for a sick child and, and uh, all of the, the things, and, and somebody asked me this, why do things happen? Why, why would a child get cancer? Why do things like this happen? And I've been, well, I wish I had an answer for you. You know, when I try to, try to kind of list what to do now, I don't know if I have a why, but maybe well, now what, you know? And I have to admit, you know, I, maybe I'm wrong. And a lot of the views that I have, and, and, and it's difficult for me to, to imagine how an all-powerful God could allow these things to happen sometimes. Am I the only one that thinks that? And, and, but I also realize, you know, maybe, maybe my view might be wrong. Maybe... maybe Maybe I have a, 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 difficult, or a, a limited view of things, and I don't see life in its totality. Maybe I don't see reality exactly as it is. And, and maybe I need to be humble and think that maybe there's a different view than mine, and, and maybe in the conversation and talking to other people, I can learn, and I can see life in a new way, and I can grow as a person. And when you hear the word humble, don't you think of Facebook? <laughs> way funnier in my head than it was out loud. I was like, these guys are going to love this joke that I crack about Facebook. And so you, you're, you, know, you see all these political feeds in Facebook. How many feeds have you ever seen, or how many Facebook posts have you ever seen in your feed that end with the phrase, but I could be wrong? <laughs> how many have, you just don't see that very much, do you? We all have this, this uh, tendency to think that our view of life is the correct one, that we're seeing reality as it is. But Jonah chapter 4 is about how our view of reality is incomplete. I can't see the totality of, of reality. How's that for a phrase? Um, as it actually is. I, I'm not able to do that as a human being. And so it ends with this question that acknowledges the difficulty and then invites us to, res- to respond and, and make us decide what, what, what we're going to do. So Jonah's only four chapters long. It's 48 verses. I think it's one of the best books in the Bible, if not the best. Uh, I find it personally fascinating. I think it's relevant in every age, ridiculously relevant, um, uncomfortably relevant. And um, Jonah, we don't even know what it is exactly. Is it an extended parable? Is it a moral story? We, we just don't know exactly what kind of literature it is. Regardless, it's funny. It's, it kind of reads like satire in some ways. So you have this prophet, Jonah, somebody who speaks for God, a prophet. God calls him to go to this city called Nineveh, which is in uh, Assyria at the time. And uh, instead of going to Nineveh, he runs in the opposite direction. He goes down to Joppa, which is now Yafo in Israel, Tel Aviv, Yafo. He gets uh, on a ship. He sails out into the Mediterranean Sea in the complete opposite direction of Nineveh. And a storm blows up. The sailors all realize it must be the gods that are unhappy. And Jonah's like, yep, you're right. God's unhappy with me. Throw me overboard. And the storm will stop. So they throw him overboard. And then he's flailing around in the Mediterranean. He's swallowed by a huge fish that it's supposed to be humorous. The fish swims back to the beach and vomits him up onto the shore and points him in the right direction. Then he travels to Nineveh, uh, this city in Assyria, hundreds of miles away, uh, uh, or at least 550 miles away, and he, and he gives this message to the Ninevites from God. If you don't turn from your wicked ways, God is going to destroy your city. Uh, they do turn from their wicked ways, and God does not destroy their city. And that leads us to Jonah chapter 4 because Jonah is really, really hacked off that God did not destroy their city. He wanted God to destroy their city, and that's why he ran in the first place. 
We learn that he says, he says, I knew if I came here and I gave you this message that you would spare these people. And he didn't want them to be spared. And so you have this kind of funny story where you've got this prophet who's just like the, you know, the whiskey priest, you know, the spiritual loser. He's worse than the sailors, you know, like he just, he just gets it wrong every step of the way. But somehow God's mercy is shown. And then in chapter four, we have this conversation between God and Jonah about how Jonah feels about this and about what the larger view of life is. So there are people who believe that every single thing in the Bible has to be taken concretely, literally, as it is. So you'll have folks, you know, maybe putting up an argument, here's how a guy can survive in a fish's digestive juices for three days. You know, and that's important to their view of the Bible. That's fine. There's room for everybody. I think Aaron did a great job a couple of weeks ago of pointing us down a path that, the, that these stories also function in much larger ways. That perhaps this isn't just the story about a guy named Jonah, but it's the story of a people, uh, the Israelites. And, and it's also the story of every human being. Imam Khalil pointed me in the direction of a, of a, a Muslim scholar, a scholar and his view on Jonah. It's actually, actually similar. That we, we have a lot of the character of Jonah in all of us. We can all be Jonas. And so, to make this story a little more real, the Ninevites were known, were thought of, as an extremely violent, cruel people. And they had conquered Jonah's people in the past, at some time. 722 BC, the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdoms in Israel. And it's said about the Assyrians that when they uh, blew through an area to conquer it, they sent a message to the people they conquered that you don't want to mess with us, and they sent that message by acting in the most cruel ways they could possibly devise. So, for example, they uh, would leave a battlefield once they had conquered. They would set up stakes across the battlefield, large wooden stakes, and then they would impale the bodies of the people they conquered on those stakes. So if you came out to see what happened, you would just see a field full of bodies on sticks. Uh, Sennacherib, one of the Assyrian kings, uh, bragged about conquering Babylon, its inhabitants, young and old, the kids, I did not spare. And with their corpses, I filled the streets of the city. They practiced psychological warfare, terror. It was meant to strike terror into the hearts of, of their enemies. Uh, it's thought that perhaps they invented another form of torture and humiliation called crucifixion. And so uh, the Romans got it from Alexander the Great, and it's thought that maybe Alexander the Great got it from the Assyrians. And so these are people who are thought of as extremely violent, bloodthirsty people who don't spare the kids, and they, they're as cruel as possible. Does that start to paint the, at least a bit of a picture as to why Jonah felt the way he did? If we're going to take the story seriously, are you with me? These are people who have hurt him and his people very, very deeply. So it's funny on the surface, but the, the meaning beneath is much more serious. You can kind of see why he wouldn't want the people of Nineveh to be spared. And by the way, just another little literary thing, um, there was a god in the ancient world named Nin, who was the fish god. And it's thought by some that Nineveh is named after the fish god, the city of fish. And so you kind of see kind of the literary craftsmanship of a fish getting him to the city of fish. You see that? So it may be that there's a much larger story here than just a fish's digestive juices. But that this story speaks to us in very, very deep and painful ways about how we view and respond to people who have hurt us very, very deeply. The people of Nineveh had hurt Jonah and his people very, very deeply. How do we respond to the people who have hurt us very, very deeply? So that brings us to chapter 4. We're going to read the whole thing. It's only 11 verses. Uh, and so I invite you to watch the screen. Let's read. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, the fact that God had spared Nineveh. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish, Spain. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life. For it is better for me to die than to live. Take the story seriously. Jonah, Jonah is suicidal because the, the people who hurt him are living a prosperous life. 
These people have it good. They hurt us so badly. I don't want to live in a world where people like that have it good. Right? Take it seriously. Better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down in a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat on its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. He's popping popcorn, you know, watching Nineveh. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort in the desert sun. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. God again asked Jonah a question. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And here's the question, verse 11. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. Right? That's how the story of Jonah ends with this question. So first of all, that last verse has to be every ver- vegan's favorite verse. Like, <laughs> big vegetables grow and God cares about the animals. It's great. Jonah is angry with God because God spared the people he hates. That's the dialogue. And, and Jonah is thinking, these people hurt me so badly and then they can just go on having a good life. It's not, say it with me, F-A-I, it's not fair. It's unjust that these people could act in this way, hurt me so deeply, and now they can go on having a good life. What do you mean you're not going to destroy them? I thought you're like my God. I, I thought that you would look out for me. If you're not a religious person, you could just substitute for God the word life or reality. I thought life would work out differently. I thought, I thought reality would be differently. I thought, I, I thought my life would turn out differently than this. These people hurt me so badly, and then they just keep on going. There's no fire from heaven. Like they didn't get punished. They're doing okay. I don't want to live anymore where people can hurt me like that, and then they get away with it. Can you begin to feel some of the emotion that Jonah feels? So a couple of questions. Have you experienced things that are unfair in your life? I'm, you know, maybe you don't feel like all of life is unfair, but have you experienced some things that are unfair? Maybe somebody hurt you. Maybe it was a person. Maybe it was an event. Maybe a person hurt you deeply. Maybe you're kind of in conflict with somebody now. Maybe it's not a person, but just how the things worked out. You're disappointed. You expected things to go differently. Has life been unfair in some way? It's tempting for you to get stuck in the fact that life is unfair and just kind of spin your wheels like Jonah and be stuck in anger. This is true of all of us. We don't like to admit this. We don't like to talk about it. But it's true of all of us. We just want to get stuck and spin our wheels, just get stuck in anger. And even if you want to move on, it can be hard. Maybe you've tried to move on. You've tried to f- forgive. There's, that, that, that's the real F word in churches, by the way, forgiveness. I mean, th- you know, it, it's so hard. Maybe you've tried, and you feel like you can't. Like you, it's like you try to move on, and then it just pulls you back like the waves of the sea that Jonah fell into. That chaotic sea, a symbol for chaos in the ancient world, that, that sea that those waves just crash. You try to move on, but the waves just seem to pull you back. Well, it's extremely important for us to live any kind of a life that we're intended to live, any kind of a healthy life, that we're able to be able to move on and see things as they are and not get stuck in fear and anger, being afraid that it'll happen again and being angry and, and, and just kind of spinning our wheels in those situations. Why? One of the reasons it's so important to move on and not let fear and anger control you, why is it so important? One of the reasons is because Yoda says so. All right, check it out. You remember? What's the quote? Fear 
Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. And hate leads to suffering. Hate leads to suffering, right? <laughs> you know, credit George Lucas with, I mean, just amazing wisdom right there. Fear. I'm afraid this will happen to me again. I was hurt. I was disappointed. I'm afraid it'll happen again, so now no more risk. I'm not going to be vulnerable anymore. No more relationships for me. Never going to try that again. Never going to put my hand near the stove burner. Like, you, you with me? Fear. The just boxes us in. You can't move. It's, par it's, it's paralyzing. And then that fear leads to anger because now I'm just stuck in anger that this happened to me and I can't move on and do something different, so I'm just reliving what happened. Because I'm stuck there, afraid and angry that I'm stuck there. And now, yeah, it's not that big of a jump to hate and blaming. Obviously hating the person who hurt me, but hating anybody who reminds me of them or generalizing that to a larger group of people. I just hate these people. And then, of course, once all these things are running full steam, it can lead to a lot of suffering. Um, there are plenty of people in our country who, who are afraid and angry and are now being filled with hatred and are starting to blame entire groups of people. So like, you know, if I've lost my job or I don't get paid as much as I used to, I can say, well, it's because of those people. Those people came in and took my jobs. And then it's, of course, now easy for a demagogue to come in and say, didn't those people take your jobs? And start to stir up hatred and blame and, and mobilize people to act in ways that they wouldn't normally act because they're, they're, they're afraid and they're angry and they feel hatred. You know, so there's a lot of now that directed towards people who are new to the United States, people who are immigrants to the United States. That's kind of the big picture, but it, this can work out in our own lives as well. If you've been around for Chan, uh, and Chandler for any time at all, you're going to hear the name Basha, right? There's Basha High School, Basha Grocery Stores, the chain of grocery stores. And it all started with a young man named Najib who immigrated to America from Lebanon in 1886, Najib Basha. And he started managing a store in Chandler in 1920. It went really well. And they had a son named, he and his wife had a son named Eddie, Eddie Basha, who built the Basha grocery store chain uh, that spread across the valley. Um, my day job is Chandler Christian Community Center. It started in 1966, 50 years old this year. In the early days, Basha's grocery store was where City Hall is now in downtown Chandler, and people would drive to Basha's, and he'd give them free bread. And they could go take to Chandler Christian Community Center. Right? This guy from Lebanon, Middle East, and he was very generous. And then... Eddie had a son, Eddie Jr., who did a great job with the, the family business. And before he passed away in 2013, Eddie really stuck up for immigrants in the state of Arizona. Just, this won't be on the screen, but just something he said. Arizona is a repository for immigrants from all over. Mexican miners from Mexico, Jewish merchants from California and the East Coast, Lebanese people, the Anglo people that came, the farmers, the miners, the railroad people, the cowboys. My grandparents are no different. They're just one of those strands that flowed into this hub which is today America. And so uh, Eddie Jr. there, and I'm sure the whole family, had, a, had an others-centered view that realized, no, oh, it's okay for new people to come and have jobs and build a life because they can contribute to our community the way that the Bashes have contributed to this community. That's great. That's what America is, actually. Land of immigrants. It's, we're all immigrants. And, and so, but it's easy, though, to see how this path works where fear, you're afraid, and then you get angry, and then you hate people, and then now you start to lash out at those people. And that causes a tremendous amount of suffering. Now, here's the big picture view, but personally, none of us wants to be that. None of us wants to be in our own personal lives the person who says, well, it's that person's fault. And then just get stuck in blame and fear and anger and hatred and suffering. None of us wants to be that way. So it may not be immigrants for you. It might be the person who hurt you. It might be some disappointment in your life. And you don't want to be you see what I mean? You don't want to be like the personal version of, of this anti-immigrant thing. You don't want to be blaming other people. You don't want to get stuck like that. That's how it looks in the big picture, but you don't want to be stuck like that in your own personal life. Jonah was self-centered. He cared about his own selfish interests. He didn't care about the interests of others the way the Apostle Paul talks about. And you don't want to be that person. So what would it look like to move on? What would it look like to move on from this painful uh, event or this hurt that somebody caused you. The story of Jonah ends with him sulking in anger and despair and, and blaming God for not doing 
uh, what he wanted God to do. So what would it look like to move on? Some time ago, a lady in another church I worked in I was, was dating a guy and uh, it was, was kind of not going very well. And uh, she said, my boyfriend seems to have like these, he's got an anger problem. And, w- and we'll be talking about something and all of a sudden he'll just blow up in anger. And it seems to be overblown for the situation. The anger doesn't match what we were actually talking about. It's like it triggers him. And there's anger from some, some other thing in his life. And that just kind of bursts out. We know, all, we know how that works. It's just kind of repressed anger. And, and I told her, especially for a guy, this is true of women too, but you see a lot in, in guys, that anger is often a safe way for a male in our society to express hurt. Because, you know, we're told, you know, boys don't cry. And so hurt is like a vulnerable emotion. For, you know, to, to say, I, I'm hurt makes you kind of look vulnerable. Or I'm sad, or I'm grieving. Like, that's kind of a vulnerable thing to say. And anger is like a safe way for a dude to, like, to process or show emotion. And, and without saying, I've been hurt, or I'm sad, and I'm grieving. So, uh, again, it's, this happens with women too. But in our society, the messages towards men are just, you don't grieve, you don't tell people you're sad, you don't tell people you're hurt. You can be angry, though. It's cool. It's, it's manly to be angry. And so we, we're like a society full of guys who are struggle to be vulnerable and to admit when we're hurt and to be able to grieve and shed tears, right? And so for her boyfriend, moving on would look like grieving whatever it is that hurt him because all hurts must be grieved. There's just no, there's just no way around that. Everything that's been hurtful in your life, it must be grieved, right? So if you're stuck, grief is the only way to move on. The only way to get out of that is grief. Jonah doesn't grieve the pain that was caused by the Ninevites on his people. He's just stuck in anger, fear, anger, hate, suffering, just spinning his wheels. He never actually says to God in the story, what the Ninevites did was awful. It was horrible. Don't you understand that? And just kind of gotten honest with God. That doesn't happen in the story of Jonah. He doesn't vent. We have other parts of the scripture where the author does vent. And it seems to be that God shows empathy. That like God can handle that honesty and that venting. But Jonah doesn't do that. Jonah doesn't grieve. He just kind of stays stuck in anger. What would it look like for you to grieve and move on? For some, it might be like a prayer. God, God this, was, this, was, this was terrible. The joke was on me. Like I didn't, I didn't ask for that. I didn't see it coming. I got horribly hurt, or horribly disappointed. And, and vent that, like as if God were a counselor, vent that prayerfully to God. That would be a great spiritual practice, actually. And it may be that, yeah, you need a friend, a human, to sit across from and vent that to and grieve, or maybe a counselor. I love counselors. And, 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 and you, can, you can sit down with a human being who's a professional and tell them about what happened. And they can empathize with you. And, and the thing is, though, when you're stuck, grief is the only way out. The anger is just going to keep you spinning there like it did for Jonah. So last question <clears throat> as we talk about how to, or we think about how to move on. Maybe this can help as well. How clearly can you see what hurt you? If it was a person, how clearly do you see that person and the motivation behind their actions, why they did what they did? How clearly can you see the totality of that person? If it was an event or just a disappointment, how clearly do you see that situation and all the factors that went into it? How clearly do you see those things? Here's the question we all most must answer that Jonah ends with. Verse 11, we read it. God says to Jonah, and should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? So a way of, of rephrasing that question is, should I not show concern uh, compassion to others as I show it to you. God asks Jonah, should I not show the same compassion to other people as I show to you? And let's say you're a person who struggles with faith and metaphysical things. Maybe you kind of consider yourself a secular person. Let's rephrase this question. Let's go to the next uh, graphic. 
This is maybe you asking yourself the question, should I not show the same compassion to others as I show to myself? If you want to follow God, what that means is your, your concept of God is often the idealized view of yourself. And, so, and it's all about imitating God. It's what religion is. And so if God shows compassion, then I, I want to imitate that. And so the question now becomes a personal one. Should I not show the same compassion to others as I show to myself? And this is now, you thought that was hard. It's going to get even harder. The word concern that we have in, in this translation um, can also be translated pity, um, empathy, um, care. It's a, it's a strong emotive word in Hebrew that Jonah has written in. It's the word hus. Everybody say hus. Hus. It's a very, very, it almost sounds guttural, like it's coming from your guts, doesn't it? Hus. It's, it's, a, it's an extremely strong word. And it's a word that actually makes a great word picture because it's a word that's connected to the eyes as in how we see, but it's, it's also connected to the idea of where do our tears come from? The same thing we see with. So it's the idea of shedding tears over what you see. Hus that I look at somebody and I feel such concern for them, such compassion for them, that I shed tears when I look at them, that I'm able to see them so clearly in the totality of who they are, that I'm able to now empathize with them, psychologically, here's how it works, that I see myself in them, that I realize we're no different. We're all human. We're all on the same level playing field. And I can see that person in totality, and I see them clearly, and I shed tears of compassion for that person. That just made it a lot worse, didn't it? Now think of little Presley, six-month-old little girl. It's easy to feel huss for Presley, isn't it? You look at a little girl, six months old, struggling with cancer, and we have three people in our congregation battling cancer. And you look at her, and it's easy to shed tears of compassion because it's so heartbreaking. That's hus. Now, God's question to Jonah says, okay, sometimes it's easy to show hus, but should I not show hus to everybody, including the Ninevites? I show it to you, I show it to all people, including the Ninevites. This, ladies and gentlemen, is hard stuff. For some of us, you know, you never know what people are dealing with and what they're thinking of when we talk about people who have hurt them or, you know, events that they're disappointed in. Some people are thinking of like the annoying coworker. you know, you're convinced Dwight Schrute works in your office, you know, and you, sometimes that's what people think of, like, oh, jeez, right? Other times, I mean, people have been raped. They've been molested. They've been horribly abused. And so you, it's just, it's hard to tell where people are coming from. So that's why I say talking to, talking to a professional, is that might be what's required to get unstuck, to where you're not imprisoned by something that was done horribly to you, and that abuse just continues. So I would never want somebody to skip that and then think, well, I have to show compassion to the person who raped me, so now I'll be a nice Christian now, and I'll show... I would never want somebody to do that without the long, hellish work of dealing with that grief and that anger and that pain, right? And then you eventually can get to a place here where this can just almost like automatically happen. And then you're free. Is everybody with me on that? I, I would never want somebody to skip the, the real important work trying to do what they, you know, what a good Christian ought to do. Would never want to do that. The point is to deal with these things in whatever way necessary so that we get to the place where this just kind of automatically happens. Because once we're, we're able to get free of the anger and the fear and hate and, and all the things that we don't want to have anyway, now we're able to see clearly. And, and we can even feel compassion for somebody who has hurt us. 
Not, it doesn't mean what they did was right. No, it doesn't excuse them. It doesn't pretend like it didn't happen. It doesn't mean we trust them again because trust is earned over time, correct? It just means I see that person differently now. Somebody posted this on Facebook from a Hindu teacher in the 20th century. He's credited as saying, if you're willing to look at another person's behavior toward you as a reflection of the state of their relationship with themselves, rather than a statement about your value as a person, then you will, over time, over a period of time, cease to react at all. Do you follow that? If I'm able to see this person who hurt me, their, their real problem is within themselves. It's not a, it has nothing to do with me, frankly. It's not a, a reflection on my value. The, Ninev the Ninevites conquering the Israelites doesn't have anything to do with the Israelites. I mean, the Ninevites are people who conquer people, and they're cruel. And no, it doesn't make it right. They're sick. But it's, it's them. It's their problem. You know, their problem isn't my problem. I'm not a reflection of them. That's, just, that's, that's what that person did. And that's their thing. Yes, it, it hurt me deeply. But I'm not intertwined with that person somehow. I'm a separate human being of immense dignity and value and worth. And, and I'm, I'm uh, worthy of compassion when other people view me to shed tears of compassion over their view of me. So whatever it is, someone invite us to pray together in a moment, whatever it is that was done to you, hurt, hurt you deeply, or some event that disappointed you, I'm gonna invite us to go ahead and close our eyes, uh, bow your head if you're comfortable doing that, and just kind of find a place of, uh, a place of peace for a moment. To think uh, about our answer to this question, should I not show the same compassion to others as I show to myself? Well, yeah, we wanna do that. And so I wanna ask you in your mind's eye, where are you in that continuum? Are you, are you at a place where you feel like, yeah, you know what, I am kind of free, and I feel like I could show compassion, that I could, I could view everybody through hus, through eyes of hus, pity, concern, empathy, compassion. Or maybe you're on the other end of the spectrum, and you're like, you know what, this is so fresh and hurtful, I just feel like I'm spinning my wheels in fear and anger and hatred, and I don't, I don't know how to get free. I would love to be able to get free, but I don't know how. And if that's you, maybe the, maybe the beginning point is talking to a counselor, like I've done a few times in my life. It's been incredibly helpful to me. Or maybe it's a friend, or maybe it begins with a prayer of just honesty and venting and, and beginning to grieve what happened, that grief is the way out, seeing that grief is the way out to get unstuck. Maybe that's where you are right now. Maybe you feel like you're somewhere in between. And maybe you feel like, I have grieved, but it's just still there. And if that's you, well, I mean, the, the good news and the bad news. Is, first of all, the good news is you've done some grieving. The bad news is we don't control when grief ends. And, and grief runs its course. And so the right thing for you is to keep grieving, to keep shedding tears, to keep feeling it until it just lessens and lessens and lessens. And to express that grief, talk about it with friends who love you or a counselor. Just keep grieving. And for some of us, you know, we, we have grieved it a long time. And maybe it's just realizing, you know what, to see this person with eyes of hus, it's, yeah, okay, it's good to realize. It's not excusing them. It's not acting like it didn't happen. It's not diminishing my pain. It's not trusting them. Trust is earned. But it's just a decision on my part to be free. Unlike Jonah, to not be stuck in anger. And just, you know what, we're all, we're all human and to see everybody the way God does through eyes of us.